Watch This Week in Missouri Politics, Sunday mornings at 11 on ABC 30. Yep. But first, we're joined by the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee, Senator Kurt Schaefer. Senator, welcome. Scott, thanks for having me on. First things first, an issue that hasn't really been talked about yet this session, but is coming to the forefront, is a, is a statute you filed, or a piece of legislation modeled after the federal RICO statute. Can you explain that to us? Yeah, when you say the RICO law, a lot of people know what that means on the federal level. It's the Racketeering Influenced and Criminal Organizations Act, and it's the law that the federal government passed in the 1970s to really cast a broader net over things like organized crime, uh, human trafficking, things where it's mo the, the crime is bigger than just the individual crimes that, that an individual may be charged with. And so we don't have anything like that in, in the state of Missouri. Some uh, states do. We haven't. And so when you look at issues like human trafficking, political corruption, uh, gang violence, it really is a bigger picture net that allows the state to come in, cast a broader net, get more people involved in the network of crime, and keep them off the streets. So let's tie in, so you talk about the RICO bill. There was also some discussions about political corruption this week with the ethics bill that was passed. A lot of folks ballyhooed it. Was, it was an odd thing. There was a lot of folks that wrote editorials pining for an ethics bill. Then they got this one. What is different tomorrow if this bill is put into law? You know, We've taken a lot of criticism for not passing an ethics bill in the last few years, and it's true. We haven't passed one in a while, although we've had a lot of them out there, and we've tried to get them through. I think on this one, it bans lobbyist gifts and a lot of other things that, that are the most notorious issues, the things that the public sees, and really it undermines the public public's confidence in what we do. I think Senator Ron Richard uh, from, from, uh, uh, from Joplin, who's our floor leader, it was his bill, and I think he did a very nice job of keeping this bill tight. In other words, not letting it be a Christmas tree with a whole lot of things, and people say, well, you know, maybe you want more things in there. But the problem is that that's how these bills don't get passed. They get too big, they get too onerous. He kept it tight. I think it's a good bill, and I think we're going to get it all the way through. So some people have said, what's different? So you can... Every legislator can still become a lobbyist. It's elected today. So 10 years from now, a term-limited legislator can no longer become a lobbyist. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. After the 2016 election cycle, there would be a two-year waiting period, which that's been some criticism, is the re re revolving door, really, where people, as soon as they leave office, they come in. That would be prohibited. Uh, and then also, uh, as I said, a lot of lobbyist gifts, other things that people see that really jeopardizes the way people feel about the legislature, those things would be banned as well. Seem to be a little bit of an inside Jefferson City feel to this. Have you heard this? You're running for attorney general. You're all over the state. Do people come up to you outside of politics and say, I really care about some ethics bill? Well, I think they do. I, I think it's interesting because a lot of people don't necessarily hit, tie that to their own elected official, mm -hmm. but they see it on a broader statewide basis. But I think it's necessary for us to get this bill moving, get this bill across the finish line to make sure that we don't lose the public's confidence. Sure. Uh, Back to uh, you being the chairman of the budget committee. So you've been the budget chair for four sessions now, past four budgets, is that correct? Yep. Well, this is actually the budget we're working on now would be the fifth budget. The fifth budget. The past four have all been balanced, right? Correct. Absolutely. What's this year's budget look like? You know, the, the 2016 budget, we don't go by calendar year. We mm -hmm. go by fiscal year that starts July 1st. You know, it's a tight budget, but we're projecting about 3.6% general revenue growth for the state of Missouri for 2016. That translates into about $300 million extra dollars of, over what we had this year. And so, you know, allocating that to K-12 through education, making sure that we keep a tight uh, balanced budget and we're fiscally responsible as we always are. You know, that's the balancing act, but that's how the process works. It's how much money do we have and what are we going to spend that money on? We've obviously had a lot of fights with the governor. The governor wants to do Medicaid expansion, has tied a lot of money to that. Uh, we don't think that's realistic. We don't think it's fiscally responsible and that's why we haven't built it into the budget. So your budget will be a more conservative budget based on your revenue projections. Absolutely. Do you think the governor can stay within that? You know, I think he can. The problem we've had with this governor is we give him a balanced budget, but then he manipulates the budget and he moves money around. It's really, there, there's some accounting tricks and, and some budget maneuvers that we've never seen from another governor before. Governor Nixon has really driven a bus through what was uh, a minor ambiguity in some of the budget areas before, but now he's really made that his practice. That really precipitated the need for Amendment 10, which voters passed this past fall, which says the legislature now has a new constitutional tool when the governor does these things so we can override him on just withholding money in addition to line item vetoes. So how has that changed your approach to putting the budget together, having Amendment 10? I think what it means is we're going to have to do the budget a lot earlier than it's ever been done in the history of the state of Missouri. We've got to give the governor the budget earlier in the process, and we are on track to do that. You know, it makes more work for us, but that's our job, to make sure that what we appropriate actually gets sent to the program that we intend intended it to go to to help Missourians. And so we're going to make sure that happens. It's going to require us to, again, do the budget a little bit earlier this year, but I think we'll get that done. 
Is that something you being a budget chair for now five years, do you think that's something that's helped you as you've put these together in the past? You sort of know where the governor, where those ambiguities exist. Yeah, you know, not only how, how that process works, but actually what goes to these programs. And, you know, it's been really interesting because I was on the committee, the Appropriations Committee, uh, for two years before I was the chairman. And, you know, you learn quite a bit about it, but until you have to sit down and be the one to sign off on these numbers and really have a, 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 a complete understanding of what these numbers are, I think you really don't know how state government works. And so not just the maneuvering the governor's doing, but, but what's really happening behind the scenes on these numbers. And, and I've been very fortunate to be in a position to, to get that understanding. It was interesting that understanding seemed to come to the forefront last month, or I guess in December, when the governor thought he needed a special session to appropriate funds for Ferguson. You sort of stepped up to the plate and explained some things. Can you give me the short uh, explanation of what happened there? Sure. With the civil unrest that we saw in Ferguson and surrounding areas, the governor brought in the, the Highway Patrol, brought in the National Guard, and clearly that cost the state some money. But we anticipate those things. So, for example, for emergencies exactly such as what we saw in Ferguson or even the Joplin tornado uh, before that and, and other things that we've seen flooding in, in mid-Missouri, we build in an amount of money for the governor to spend in case of emergency. For this uh, budget year, we had given him $19 million. And so he had only spent about two and a half million dollars, $3 million of that, when he said he was gonna have to call us back into a special session, which costs about $100,000 a week, by the way, to do a special session, and say that we need to give him more money so he could do his job in Ferguson. Well, he still had you know, $16 million left to do his job. You know, somebody would have to ask the governor if they could ever get a hold of him, you know, what his plan was on that. But I think it really was to deflect attention away from the governor and try and put something back on the legislature when it really wasn't a legislative issue. Did the governor call you before he made the announcement? No, we, we actually heard about it through the media. <laughs> well, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, Thanks for the heads up. On to the, uh, the attorney general race. Uh, you're running for attorney general. You're the only announced Republican candidate. The Democratic field's now splitting up into a primary. Why, why are you running? You know, I started my legal career 20 years ago as a prosecutor in the attorney general's office. I was both a criminal prosecutor doing death penalty cases as well as a number of other cases uh, in that office around the state, uh, complex civil litigation, the whole host of things that the attorney general's office does in the state of Missouri. I've pretty much done all of them. And uh, in my years of private practice, I really have always kept a focus towards that attorney general's office and tying that back in with my desire to be uh, a, a public servant and to be back in the public sector. There are so many things that I think we could do with that office to protect Missourians. And I think the RICO bill that I filed is a good example. So whether it's human trafficking, organized crime, political corruption, which again, you know, that's the thing we're talking about with the ethics bill, but it really comes down to, okay, what's the hammer? If somebody does get on the wrong side of this issue, what do you do? Well, it's a, that's a good example of what the attorney general could do to make sure that we stop human trafficking, stop political uh, uh, corruption. It, it's a great job if, if you're in a position of having the experience to fight for Missourians. You've been in Missouri courtrooms for 20 years as I have, and you want to use that experience in a way that you believe will best serve the people of the state of Missouri, and in a way that, frankly, uh, you know, there's not a lot of people out there who have a combination of that experience, including being appropriations chairman, understanding how these programs work, where there's some manipulation in the budget where there shouldn't be, and bringing all that together to make sure when you walk into that courtroom, you're fighting for Missourians and you know what you're doing. Well, the, the current attorney general, Chris Coster, was a prosecutor before. Do you think that's almost a thing that you should definitely be, have in, in, your, in your background to, to be the attorney general of the state? I absolutely do. And when you look at the number of cases, that's certainly uh, uh, a number of cases. The Attorney General's Office does a lot of other things, including consumer protection, both civil and criminal. So there's some criminal cases there, too. But it's so important. And, you know, when you've been in the position that I've been in, where, where for example, on a murder case, you have been in the courtroom and you have held the hand of a mother or a father or a sister of someone who's been murdered by a defendant sitting right there across the table. It is so important to know what that experience is, to know how that affects people, and to know how to work within that process to get justice for the victims. And so I, I, I think it's a non-starter. I think you have to have that experience if you're gonna do that job. Speaking of the campaign, how's it going? I mean, you're making the rounds in the state. How's the fundraising going? What's the minimum reception? It's going great. Uh, we, we're, we're doing very, very well. The response has been overwhelming. Uh, you know, 
for my Senate reelect and including my first Senate campaign, you know, we did very well in fundraising. We're doing very, very well on fundraising for the attorney general's race. And as you know, uh, you know, that's that's the part that a lot of people don't like to talk about. But it's certainly the part that I makes do. it necessary to have the ability to get your message out there. So when you talk about things like who has the experience because they prosecuted a death penalty case, because they put a murderer behind bars, you have to be able to get that message out there. Senator, thank you very much for joining.